Well, hey, Sats here. I hope you're doing very well. Welcome to C3 Reflect. Today, it's nice to get to spend some time uh, together and uh, really praying this message is gonna encourage you. But hey, if you are brand new, stumbling across us online, make sure you hit subscribe. Uh, hit that button so we can keep rocking up uh, in your space and uh, hopefully keep sharing some great encouraging content um, for you. And uh, if you've been kind of lurking around, maybe a few weeks, a few months, and you just want to let us know that you're actually here, I think that can be a really cool thing to do, rather than kind of hiding away in the shadows, the corridors of the internet. Um, hey, I just know that God has designed us to actually be in community and to uh, you know live out following Jesus or beginning our faith journey wherever we are um, in community. And so uh, if you want to do that and just let us know that you're around and you've been tuning in for a bit, whether you're in London or somewhere else in the world, uh, you can go to our website c3reflect.church slash connect and you can put your details in there and uh, we'd love to uh, connect uh, with you. So hey we're coming towards the end of a nine-week series called Influencers. We're in week eight so well done if you've been tracking with us so far and really we've been sharing about uh, three parts of our vision and and that's what makes this series really unique actually is it's not just a preaching series about an idea but it's also something that comes directly from who we are as a church and uh, there's three things that we see as part of our vision that we we want to help people connect into community i mean we talked about that a little bit already but you know it really is impossible to be a healthy christian let alone a healthy human outside of community. We all need people speaking into our lives, rubbing shoulders with us, encouraging us. Uh, no one can make it on their own and uh, no one can make it in a healthy way uh, on their own. We need each other and uh, we find that as followers of Jesus, we're united in Christ. And so actually this uh, community component is so essential um, to uh, following Jesus. Uh, secondly, um, you know, we want to help you transform into the image of Christ. Um, you know, the whole Christian idea is not just moral code. It's not just change of behavior. It's actually this spiritual reality that has taken place that Jesus has died on a cross. That's historical reality. And in that moment has spiritually taken on the sins of the world upon himself. He's been raised to life by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we share in that moment and in that old identity being crucified in the cross with Christ and also the raising of the new us. And so we should expect that when we receive Jesus, we then go on this journey where the other parts of our, our thinking, our behavior, our actions, our relationships, the way we interact with culture and with our world begins to catch up uh, to, to this reality of our new identity in Christ. And so we begin to change. Um, you know, I love to say that God loves you exactly as you are, but he wants you to change. Uh, he believes in who you're becoming. And uh, just like a child grows up, God wants you to grow up in the faith to become everything you're called to be. And uh, it's a good place. It's a good thing to mature. It's a good thing to grow up. No one should be a child forever. And uh, thirdly, uh, we're here to influence the world. And uh, influence is this really cool like byproduct. It's, it's a fruit of a healthy person in community who is experiencing life transformation through Jesus. And uh, the, the end result is this natural overflow of influence, of life, of peace, of blessing. And we command a blessing into our world and we begin to make things better wherever we go. And that's what influence is about. And that's what this series is about as we share nine components of influence broken down from those three sort of parts of our vision, split them into another few threes. And uh, there we go, we've got nine weeks. Now, what's really cool is at the end of this series, um, we want to invite you to be a part of something called uh, the Influencers Discipleship Framework. And uh, what that is, is uh, if you think these, these nine things are a good sort of uh, uh, language for expressing what it means to be a follower of Jesus, and you resonate with these values, you can actually say, yeah, I, I actually want to step up and be a part of this. And we meet every single month as a group to pray together and to uh, eat food together and hang out and uh, just to go a little bit deeper uh, together, encourage and equip one another. And, and Jesus had a, a few different environments. He had the 72, he had the crowds, he had the 12. And you know, not everybody was in every setting. And uh, that's not uh, because God didn't want people there. It's because, interestingly enough, Christianity is both exclusive and inclusive. It's inclusive in the sense that God invites every single person to draw near to him. But it's exclusive in, in the sense that you have to decide that you want to come on board. And so that's what we're creating, an opportunity to say, I'm in. And uh, in doing so, not only do you get to attend those events, but um, you'll also um, have a seat at the table, uh, you know, around the decisions, of church life and the future and 
we want to hear from you. We want, we want community to be a heart of everything we're doing. We want to uh, get great wisdom and insight from across the board. Uh, but we want to do that from people who are actually tracking with us and uh, you know are actually following Jesus. And so you get yourself a seat at the table by uh, having that buy-in. And uh, also, uh, thirdly, you're just putting up your hand to say, hey, I'm here. I want to get discipled. Uh, I want you to speak into my life. And uh, that's just cool. We'll be praying for you and uh, believing for everything that God has for you. And it just means that there's a, a layer of discipleship that you can step into and demonstrate your intention. Uh, so that's influencers, and uh, you can check out the details on the website um, to uh, join that and become a part of that. And uh, today we're talking about the eighth, eighth element of influence, and that is service. Well, today we are talking about the eighth element of influence, and it's service. And it's all about making other people great, all about serving other people. And uh, this is such an important component of being a follower of Jesus, and that's because Jesus uh, modeled this uh, so clearly uh, he came to serve. I want to read you uh, something from Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 to 11. It says this, So, if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy... Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Okay, this is, this is awesome right here. Right here we we, we just have encapsulated for us this summary of Jesus and uh, Jesus the servant. And what I love here is, is you know, Jesus has got everything. He's God. Uh, you know, I can think of much better things to do than to come to earth, take on a human form. Jesus was fully human, fully divine, a fully man, fully God, to take on the, the frailties of the human condition. And to go to the cross and to give his life, to literally empty his life out on the cross in the most painful, excruciating, tangible way to give his life for you and I. This is the example of Jesus that we are following. And one of the things so interesting about this is that for Jesus, it's like everything begun with, with, with confidence. It says that though he was fully God, he laid down all of those godly attributes. In other words, he, he stooped down, he descended. So I think one of the massive barriers for us when it comes to this idea of service, I mean, we read here about being humble, about preferring one another, and not being selfish, uh, having selfish ambition, but, but hey, taking care of one another. And, and what I love about Jesus is, is the example of Jesus is Jesus came from a place of security says that he, he knew he was God. Even though he was fully God, he didn't count his status. He didn't count his power as to be something that should be utilized for his benefit. Instead, the Bible actually tells us that we were dead in our sins. That was the point that Christ died for us. So, so that tells me, first of all, something about your value in the eyes of God. I mean, value is all relative, but I feel like God's a good measure of value. God saw fit to, to, to come in human form. Jesus came and emptied himself on the cross for you and I. And I want to just speak that over you right now. You have great value. How much value? Well, the blood of Jesus was shed for you. And, and Jesus does this incredible act of service. How and why? Well, I believe that Jesus knew who he was. And so he was able to serve. Here's, here's the thing, you know, uh, in, in life, we're, we're, we're often looking for, for, for things to fulfill us and complete us. And so when we're not really sure of who we are and, you know, we're always looking to gain approval, aren't we? And, and, and it's one of the big barriers for us in serving one another is, is actually we've kind of got a little itch on the inside of us to be noticed, to be seen, to be elevated. 
And depending on our background and our family upbringing and all that sort of stuff, how our parents raised us, we, we re react to those things. And if we've been in an environment where it was all about achievement and getting the next thing and, and there was like a bit of a pressure upon us, then often when we become an adult, we're always searching for that affirmation, searching for that, for that thing. We always want to be first. We always want to win. We always want to overcome. We always want to get the next thing. And, and what I love about Jesus is Jesus doesn't have any of these insecurities and he comes with the full knowledge of who he is. He's God. Like he's got nothing to prove. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's got nothing to prove. He's, he knows who he is. And from that place of confidence, Jesus serves humanity in the most incredible way. Here's what I understand, friends, is, is that when people are, are people who serve, you have to be a confident person, secure in yourself. Because when you are serving and elevating others, you know what's happening? Is you're getting left behind. <laughs> when you're elevating other people, the fear and the worry is, well, well what about me? And people are not going to notice me. And, and, and when you're hungry for affirmation and hungry for love, it's hard to serve people. But Jesus completely, fully aware that he was God, emptied himself on the cross. And then this is what it says, which is really cool. It says, so God has highly exalted him. There's so many scriptures that talk about the link between humility and exaltation. God exalts the humble. This is the crazy thing that happens, that, 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 that if you truly want to live a great life. See, Paul is saying here, have humility, follow this example. Jesus has modeled for us, true greatness. And if you and I can actually adopt his example and put on humility, I mean, we don't do it so that we'll be exalted, but there is quite a nice byproduct of God actually exalting you. And we're talking about influence. And we understand that when God elevates someone, it's, it's not about us. It's actually about what we can bring to others. And you see, see, Jesus used his power for everybody else. So God elevated him. And so now we have actually been able to be given access to the power of God. Why? Because of the exaltation of Jesus. And I just know that, that God is calling us to take our place in this world and to be a light and to, to be okay with God using us, but it is going to require humility. Now, this is the thing about humility. Humility is not kind of this idea of kind of being sort of, uh, you know, really sort of weak and really sort of um, almost like withdrawn and just like we never talk and we, we always look down and that's not what humility actually is. Um, humility is not actually about you becoming less. Humility is actually about you becoming more. Let me just explain this because there's another scripture uh, where, where, uh, where I think it's a conversation uh, with, with John the Baptist and he says, hey, I must become less that he can become more. He's talking about Jesus. But we'll just consider for a moment because I've heard that quoted so many times in this context about becoming less. Oh, I just want to become less so that Jesus can become more. Consider this, John the Baptist was not, not becoming less John the Baptist. John the Baptist was talking very practically in the space, hey, you know, the, the less I'm around, the more Jesus can actually occupy that space. He wasn't talking about being less him. He was talking about creating space for Christ. You see, when I uh, 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 don't show up on the inside, when I retreat from my life, when, when, when I'm absent, I don't help anyone. In fact, if I'm to serve my family, I must be more present, not less present. If I'm going to be a blessing to people in my world, it doesn't help them or serve them if, if I start to shrink back. No, it's actually when I fully occupy the space and I'm there to serve. If I choose to become less, I'm actually choosing to serve less. The more present I am, the more I give, the more I input, the more I can actually serve people. So humility is not about becoming less. Humility is actually just simply about placing value in other people. See, Jesus, who's God himself, he, he knew who he was. And he knew who we were, but he elevated us. That's what humility is about. Humility is about placing value in other people. And when we posture ourselves with this sort of great spirit, we're going to find that God is going to be able to flow through us and bless many people. And God is going to elevate our platform and cause us to have more influence. Why? Because we're actually doing some good stuff. <laughs> God doesn't want to elevate us when we're miserable and grumpy. God wants to elevate people who are bringing light into this world. And we can do that when we, we have this posture, just like Jesus, this example of servanthood, not out of obligation, not because it's something we've got to do, something we've been told to do, but because we genuinely delight to place value and communicate the love of God on people around us. I want to take us just to um, a really interesting uh, story in Genesis chapter 37. And it's a story about a guy called uh, Joseph. 
and uh, there's plenty going on in, in the scripture about Joseph. And I and, uh, just want to come back to this idea about, about service has to come from a place of confidence. And it has to come from a place where we know we are loved. Here's, here's what it says in Genesis uh, 37, verse 1. It's quite a long passage of scripture, so, so we'll just go with it. Um, Jacob, that's Joseph's dad, lived in the land of his father's sojournings, in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel, another name for Jacob, loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age and he made him a robe of many colors but when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all of his brothers they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him now Joseph had a dream and when he told it to his brothers they hated him even more he said to them hear this dream that I've dreamed behold we were binding sheaves in the field and behold my sheaf arose and stood upright and behold your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf and his brother said to him, are you indeed to reign over us or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream, told it to his brothers and said, behold, I've, I've dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that you've dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. Okay. We're going to pick up the story uh, again in just a moment, but I just want to pick up a couple of things. So here we have Joseph, who's 17 years old. And, and Joseph is the favorite son. Okay, so we've got to talk about that for a moment because that is some rubbish parenting going on right there. <laughs> All of his brothers hated him because he was the favorite son. Now, what had actually happened is we're going the backstory of Jacob. It's a bit messy. Jacob fell in love with this girl called Rachel. And there was a whole arrangement there that he was going to work for Rachel's dad and, and for seven years so that he could win her hand in marriage and all of this stuff. And that's what happened apart from when, when, when they did that, actually uh, uh, Laban, who was Rachel's dad, gave away a different girl instead. So he didn't get the girl that he fell in love with and he married somebody called Leah as well. And, 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 and Leah, she, sorry, she, she, was, she, she was not loved by Jacob. So we're seeing a lot of dysfunction in this family. And so Jacob works another seven years to finally win the girl that he actually wanted to marry. And then, you know, then they come together. And so this is the family dynamic that Joseph is born into, a fairly dysfunctional environment. And uh, it just goes to show, you know, although there is plenty of stuff that happens in the Bible, just because it is described doesn't mean that it is prescribed. When we move away from God's design for marriage and relationships, we actually begin to see dysfunction. And we see it directly here in this, this lack of unity and jealousy between the brothers. Now, Joseph is the firstborn of, of Jacob's favorite wife. And so... He's favored. That's why he's the, he's the one. He, he grows up knowing that he is loved. He's got a special coat. He's got all the stuff. And his father showers attention and love onto him. Now watch what happens. There's it's some major parenting issues, but let's ignore that for a moment. Watch what happens with Joseph from a, from a place of security, from a place of knowing who he is, of a place of confidence. What happens? He begins to dream. So you see, when we are confident in who we are, we're going to find that dreams are going to uh, be, 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 be materialized in that environment. Our ability to picture the future and look what happens for his brothers who don't have that sort of attention. They are craving the attention of their father. And so they become jealous and they become angry. Why? Because they are missing their insecurities on the inside of them are causing them to, to move away from God's design for them. They're, they're not able to serve. And we're going to see in the story of Joseph, if you know it, wherever he goes, he serves and he's elevated and he succeeds and he's promoted. Why? Because he carries this, this heart of a servant. But for me, it stems right back to here, his identity from his father that he is loved. Parenting tip, 
Don't let your children know that you have a favorite child. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a good idea. I got four kids and they are awesome, but they are all my favorite uh, children. So um, let's keep reading. Verse 12, now his brothers went to pasture, their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, I know your brother's pasturing the flock at Shechem. Come and I will send you to them. And he said to him, here I am. So he said to him, go now and see if it is well with your brothers and the flock and bring me some word. So, so Jacob, the dad is, is trying to patch up relationship with the brothers. So Joseph, why don't you go and kind of help them out? And, you know, Joseph's 17 as well. He's, he's made some, he's sharing all these sorts of dreams. He's a bit cocky. He's not being very clever about it uh, at all or, or sort of sensitive to the situation, but he's the favorite son. So he's, he's in a whole world of, uh, of his own. So, uh, uh, you know, he, he sent him to the Valley of Hebron and he came to Shechem and the man found him wandering in the fields. And the man asked, what are you seeking? And he said, I'm seeking my brothers. And he said, tell me please where they're pasturing the flock. And the man said, they've gone away. For I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from afar. And before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. Oh my gosh. I mean, this is not, this is not a good family. <laughs> There's all sorts of crazy stuff going on here. This is how dysfunctional this family. And this is the product of, of these brothers that their, their insecurity is causing them to, to behave like this. Um, so they said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of the pits. And then we'll say that a fierce animal has devoured him, but we'll see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he rescued him out of the house saying, let us not take his blood, uh, his life. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood, throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him that he might re rescue him out of their hand to restore him to his father. So this is interesting because Reuben's actually the firstborn of all the brothers. And there's a bit of like awkwardness in the family situation because the, him, Reuben, has slept with one of his father's, um, you know, sort of uh, concubines or whatever you want to call it. It's all a bit dysfunctional. And he has fallen out of favor with his father, Jacob. So Reuben right now is trying to get back into favor because every single one of us are being driven by our insecurities. When there's stuff on the inside of us, we are looking to gratify, to affirm, to confirm that, that, that we are loved. We're searching for the thing that we do not have. And that's exactly what's happening here. The reason they want to kill Joseph is because he's the favorite, because they think if we can get rid of the favorite, then maybe our father will see us. Again, big parenting fail. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they tuck him and threw him into the pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. And then they began to eat. And looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm and myrrh on their way to carry it down uh, to Egypt. And so they sell Joseph as a slave to these guys. And Joseph gets sent away. And if you know the story that I'm not going to go into the whole thing, but he gets put into, uh, you know, as a slave, he's working for a household. Then he gets accused of a crime that he didn't commit and he gets put into prison. And everywhere he is, he gets elevated and he just makes the decision, I'm just going to serve. And so he serves in the prison. So much so that the, 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 the guy who's looking after the prison puts him in charge of the prison. <laughs> he's like a prisoner. And then there's some guys in there and he, he, he tells them what their dreams are and he just tries to serve wherever he is. And, and that's eventually how he gets out and he, and he comes and he's positioned into the land. And this, this is the kind of summary of, of Joseph's life, of this spirit of servanthood in, in Genesis chapter 39, verse 21. It says, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. So this is talking about that, a prison bird, but this is the story of the whole way through. And the keeper... Um, uh, uh, of the prison, put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners um, who, were, who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. And the keeper of the prison uh, paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. Okay, friends, I, I just wonder, because there's something so fascinating here. Joseph is, from, you know, obviously has had a great start to life and then it goes dramatically downhill. He's the favorite child. He's got all this privilege and this cool stuff happening. And then there's this slow decline. But in every season where life comes against him and pain is there and injustice takes place and all of the difficulties and suffering of this life, in every single season, somehow he prospers. And, and, and I just want you to imagine that in your life, that wherever you go and whatever you do and whatever is thrown your way, fair or unfair, just or unjust, what would happen if you could write that about yourself, that whatever you did, the Lord would make it succeed? Well, I'm telling you right now, if we can put this, this element of influence 
into play in our life, this idea of service. If we can position our hearts to be people who are here to serve, I can tell you right now that the Lord will be with you wherever you go and he will make you succeed. Why? Because God wants to elevate those with servant hearts. God loves to increase the influence of those who are actually here to serve. Because what we understand is that influence is not about us. Power is not about us. Status is not about us. Great wealth and riches are not about us. These are things that God gives to us so that we could bless our world. That we could look around us and see the need and see the pain and see the suffering and be an agent for change in our world. That's what influence is really about. Influence is not about us looking great and getting a product deal on Instagram. Influence is about us sowing into this world. And that's what service is all about. And that's the example of Jesus. I want to just end on one last scripture, Matthew 20, uh, verse 20 to 28. This is, this is what it says. And uh, this is a story about a couple of the disciples of Jesus. And then the mother of the sons of Zebedee, great name, came up to him with her sons and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, what do you want? And she said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in the kingdom. Jesus answered, you, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? And they said to him, we are able. And he said to them, you'll drink my cup, but to sit on my right hand and my left is not mine to grant, but it's for those for whom it has been prepared by my, my father. And when the 10 heard it, that's the rest of the disciples, they were indignant at the two brothers, but Jesus called them to him and said, you know, the, the, the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Friends, we need to understand that with, with, with great power comes great responsibility. It's from Spider-Man, but it's true today. Great power, the more God gives to you, the more God wants you to use what you have to be a blessing in this world. And if you seek for God to enlarge your life, understand that what you are asking for is you're asking for opportunities to serve. And I wanna encourage this because I believe we can serve this city. I believe we can serve our workplaces. I believe we can elevate the people in our world. I believe we can serve our children, serve our parents, serve our families. I believe that if we can posture that sort of greatness, we're gonna see God do incredible things and we're gonna cast a shadow of influence in our world. I'd love to maybe just pray for this just as we close. You know, because a lot of what we talked about, you know, is it relates to the issue of our heart. And, uh, you know, when we are in pursuit of things to fill the hole on the inside of us, we are never going to have space to serve. We're always going to be preoccupied by how we're coming across or what we can gain for ourselves. So we're never going to be able to actually occupy that space of greatness. And I believe that God, your purpose is great. Your life is destined for greatness, but, but I just know that we have to deal with those insecurities on the inside of us. When we are thirsty for affirmation, we, we don't make great decisions. We make decisions based on our ambition and based on our selfish needs. We, we, we can't serve one another. And I just want you to know today that you are loved by God. And you may have thought, hey, everybody else is the favorite son, the favorite daughter, it's, it's not me, but, but God doesn't have favorites. <laughs> God is no respecter of person. God has children, he doesn't have grandchildren, he has children and he loves you, he's your father. And you can know today that because of Jesus, see this is, this is amazing, our starting point today, because of Jesus is that we're a part of his family. And because we're part of his family, not only are we included and are we loved, but we're also, we have an inheritance. That, that, that there is nothing you can do to make God love you anymore. And there's nothing you can do to fall outside of His love. But right now, because of our starting point of righteousness, because of Jesus, we are actually positioned to serve. But it begins by allowing God in, allowing Him to heal our heart, and gaps where our parents didn't fill properly. Our parents are all human, and they miss the mark in a variety of ways. Some huge, some small, but every single one of us and grow up with certain cultures and expectations and ideas that have framed the way uh, that we perceive and, and live life. And I believe today that God can bring freedom into your life. You can be free from those insecurities and you can actually grow in Christ so that you can serve your world. God, I pray, fill every single person with your love 
and your presence right now. Let confidence rise, and I pray let great vision arise for our lives. God, that we would not live our lives just for us, but we'd see that true greatness is about being of service. Help us to follow your example, Jesus, we pray as we follow you to the cross and we follow you into resurrection, that we would have something to bless this world with, just as you did. We pray in the name of Jesus. God bless you guys. Thanks so much for tuning in today. We'll see you next time. Thanks so much for watching today. You might like some of these videos over here or over here. Of course, hit subscribe. And we do actually have a weekly email list where we send out content that we think is encouraging and helpful. To jump on that, just head to the description below. We'll see you guys soon.